Thank you very much. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, seminar. It's a great pleasure to have uh, our own uh, Roy Fox as a speaker here um, today. So Roy is an assistant professor of computer science. He joined UC Irvine a, a year ago um, and his specialization is really reinforcement learning and uh, also control and robotics. And um, Roy, before he joined us, was a postdoc in Berkeley where he worked on a lot of these topics before. Um, and in particular, now he's, today's talk is about um, structured control as, as inference, and he'll talk about the exciting connection between Bayesian inference, variational inference, and control. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Roy and look forward to the talk. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I wanna talk today about structured control as inference. Um, and sort of the subtitle is this uh, semi-philosophical question of uh, when optimal control isn't, isn't optimal. Um, so um, um, it may seem like maybe I'm, it's, a, it's sort of a contradiction in terms or maybe I'm being uh, figurative or tongue in cheek, I'm, I'm not. I mean this in a very specific sense, which I'll, I'll try to convey. Uh, so um, optimal control is this field of uh, when we have control um, over, over a system um, and we're trying to optimize for some preference of, of, of the outcome of that control. Um, and when we try too much to optimize, we can actually get hurt by that. We, we, can, we can actually not be optimal. So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to, uh, we'll be trying to convince you in, in various situations. Um, we're trying to have useful behavior of some, some system, some agent in an environment that's interacting with the environment. Um, and that's not the same as trying to find the most preferred behavior. So it, it can actually be detrimental to try to really find the one most preferred behavior uh, when, when we can sell for, for just a useful behavior. Um, which uh, can not just be easier, but can actually be better. So many methods in, in, in optimal control and reinforcement learning are trying to are actually trying to maximize and consider any kind of suboptimality, um, maybe a necessary evil because we can't always really uh, optimize uh, completely. But I'm gonna argue that it's not a necessary evil. It's actually what we, at least in practice, aim for. Um, so when we do sell, sell for uh, less preferred behavior, we can actually perform better under various conditions. Um, and I'll try to touch on as many of them as I have time for. But just to give you a, a, a general sense of um, what, what I'm talking about, um, when we're talking about uh, preference over control, how do we sort of list that preference? Uh, we can talk about, do we know uh, explicitly uh, the preference or imp implicitly, and do we describe in terms of how to perform the control or what we would like uh, achieve? And so uh, if we explicitly know how, maybe we can program our controller. Uh, if we uh, um, only know the what explicitly, maybe we can somehow instruct the controller, um, which is a big open problem. If we only know implicitly, so we, we, we cannot say it, but we can maybe show it, um, then uh, if we know how implicitly, maybe we can just demonstrate the task and have the controller imitate our demonstrations, uh, which is essentially supervised learning in various forms. Or if we don't even implicitly know how, but we do know the what, so it's the sort of, I know it when I see it kind of regime then we can do reinforcement learning. We can just provide these sort of uh, rewards along the way for, um, for a reinforcement learning agent trying to learn on its own. And so we'll mostly be focused, or we will only be focused on these two, imitation learning and reinforcement learning in this talk and actually the connection between them as well. So um, just to give, to give some notation, so we're talking about an agent interacting with its environment. So you can see on the left here, um, um, the agent is in green, uh, um, performing actions in the environment and getting observations, which you can see here in 
red and blue. Uh, and we have this sort of um, model of the distribution of how the state of the environment changes in response to our actions, how uh, it generates observations for uh, the agent sensors and how the agent updates its internal state, uh, which we'll uh, talk mostly about in the last part, um, and also generate actions in response to these observations. So, that, so this is like a, a, a graphical model, a Bayesian network or um, um, a stochastic process of, of this interaction. And so um, we can talk about trajectories in, in this, in, 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 uh, of these, of these uh, uh, interactions. So uh, states and actions and observations. And um, we can talk about the dynamics of those trajectories and they induce uh, together with the agent's policy, a distribution of trajectories. And then we can say, okay, now we have rewards, a function of states and actions. And there's uh, the return of the trajectory that's just the sum of rewards along the trajectory. So now we have a learner whose objective is to maximize the expected return that it can see in those trajectories that's gonna, that it's gonna perform with its environment. Uh, so we maximize over some policy, the expected uh, uh, return under this distribution that the policy uses over trajectories. And so just, just to give you a sense of what a, a reinforcement learning method can be, maybe deep reinforcement learning, so it's gradient based, so we're just gonna take the gradient of this objective with respect to our policy parameters, which turns out to have this cute little form here. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about imitation learning. And it's, there's actually a deep connection between imitation learning and, and reinforcement learning. In imitation learning, we have a teacher uh, generating demonstrations of successful behavior. Um, and so we can uh, we, we get these trajectories and we can think about uh, maybe uh, supervised learning with, with the, this data. Um, and so maybe our objective is, is the cross entropy objective, which is common in supervised learning. So we're trying to maximize over again, the learner policy, this expected log probability that the learner policy would generate the demonstration that we see the teacher demonstrating. Um, and so if we again take the gradient over this objective, we get this form, which uh, I put in a reminder here for the previous slide for the policy gradient and reinforcement learning. And you can actually see that there's a, a strong connection between the two forms. And actually the imitation learning is very much like reinforcement learning. If you think about the reward here for a trajectory, sorry, the return for a trajectory as being one, right? So we just have a one here, um, then they're the same. So it's really just, like saying uh, we have demonstrations and those are one good and others are maybe zero good, right? Um, and so it's really just seeing successful behavior. And we'll, we'll touch later on what happens when uh, we're not guaranteed uh, uh, successful uh, uh, demonstrations. So there are sort of two uh, differences remaining uh, which make, make the whole difference here. Uh, one is that um, it's really much easier to do imitation learning in a sense because we are guaranteed a good distribution of data to learn from. We are guaranteed to have uh, uh, demonstrations that are successful trajectories. Whereas in reinforcement learning where uh, the sampling here uh, of the data is from the learner distribution, which is not guaranteed to be good and is made useless. Um, the distribution here is from a teacher which is guaranteed, at least in some sense, to be valuable. Uh, but on the other hand, the rewards we get are very sparse. Remember, it's just one or zero for the entire trajectory. It's just one saying that this entire trajectory is good, but what about it is good? And so in reinforcement learning, we get the opportunity to get more dense rewards that may be more informative. And so we can ask, uh, could we actually do imitation learning with dense rewards? And um, a lot of what I'm saying here is like um, maybe new framing or newish framing for, for uh, known things, um, but, uh, but maybe it's an interesting way to look at it. So we can think of uh, the objective that we optimized so far, which is this 
uh, KL divergence, or sorry, this, this uh, maximum likelihood that, that the learner gives to the teacher demonstrations as this sort of KL divergence between um, the teacher distribution over trajectories and the learners. Uh, and, and this constant term, which, which it does not depend on our uh, parameter. Um, but what if we sort of look at the other uh, related entropy, the other um, KL term? So KL is not symmetric. What happens if we switch the order of, of the parts here? Um, and there's sort of like intuition behind it is, is that the left, uh, the left term is, left distribution is what generates the data, right? And, and that's exactly what we want to be doing. Uh, what if the learner is actually generating the data? So let's switch the order. And this is what we get. We get this, this uh, scary thing here, the expectation over the learner distribution of this log probability ratio of seeing that trajectory uh, between a, the teacher and maybe some prior, maybe, maybe it's uniform prior. And then we have another KL term, another KL divergence term between our learner and the same prior. Um, and then maybe this is just, just uniform prior. So, you can think of this, again, let's compare this to the RL objective. You can think of this as a reward, right? Um, as, uh, so, uh, so maybe the reward in a state S and an action A is just the log probability ratio between a teacher probability of taking that action and some prior, dumb prior uh, probability of taking that action. And I added this constant here because these are sort of different kinds of things. Maybe we need like a, uh, and a conversion uh, coefficient here. And we'll, we'll talk a lot about what, what it means. Um, and, and, and so maybe you can think of this as like reinforcement learning with this reward and just the regularizer. So it's a real relative entropy regularizer on the policy, uh, asking it to be close to some, some prior, not diverge too much unless it's worth it. So mm, Roy. upside. Do you take questions now or would you prefer to? Um, uh, so Andrew asked a question here in the chat. Could you re-explain what you mean by dense rewards versus sparse rewards? Great question, thank you. So if you look along the trajectory, so uh, uh, across time of the interaction of uh, the agent with the environment, do you get to see rewards along the way, uh, let's say in many steps or just once at the end? So you can think of uh, imitation learning as just seeing one reward in the end saying, this entire trajectory was good. So that's very sparse. You don't get to see anything about intermediate steps. You don't know which, so there's like the credit assignment problem. You don't know which steps are responsible for this being called success. Um, in reinforcement learning, you at least have the option of seeing rewards, non-zero rewards and maybe informative rewards in intermediate step of the interaction. So not just in the end, uh, and not just rarely, but maybe often and maybe in every step. And so what you can see here is that we actually give this reward in every step, right? So in every step we, we say, um, what is the reward you're getting for taking an action A is how much more likely this action is for a teacher uh, that knows what it's doing than for a prior that does not. Does that actually? Okay. Um, yeah, um, I think so. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of picking selected questions here from the from the chat. So please just go on and uh, That's continue. Good. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Uh, so, so the effect of this is actually sort of a flip of what we said before. So the rewards are dense. We may be getting more information per trajectory. Um, it tells us more. We, it's it may be easier to to assign credit to the, the actions that are important. Because think about it, if, if a teacher really insists that, that we take this action and not another, uh, they probably know something that's, that it's, it's important. Um, and, um, and the credit assignment is very direct. But on the other hand, we are back with learner exploration. So the distribution here of trajectories comes from the learner, not the teacher. And initially when the learner is not good, do we really see good data. Um, and that's kind of like imitation learning with uh, an algorithm called Dagger by Rossi. Um, but let's, let's see another way to look at it. 
So if we uh, sort of define rewards as these log probabilities or log probability ratio, let's let's do the let's do the other thing. Let's let's take it in the other direction and say that um, let's have a success indicator v for victory, um, where the probability it's just a binary variable where the probability of, of vt to be the to occur to be the event that occurred uh, um, is exponential in the reward. Right. So we start with the reward, and then we define the probability of, of seeing V T happen in S T and A T as this exponent here. Uh, for this to be a probability, we need maybe some uh, standardization of the reward and so on. And that's not what I want. But but then we can ask, um, what is the log probability of of success of of success of the entire trajectory? So seeing this V happen V T in every step T. What is that probability? And this is, we can sort of write this as a, as, as a base rule. Um, and it's interesting because we have this term here, the probability distribution over trajectories given success. And that's sort of what we're interested in, right? Like assume we're going to succeed in this control task. What is the what is distribution of trajectories? Um, in the posterior. Problem is this is infeasible to compute actually um, because of large number of trajectories and so on. Um, you, we can't really compute this in closed form. So we can approximate it. And it's an approximation that I'm sure many of you have seen before, which is uh, um, sort of variational inference, evidence lower bound. It doesn't have to be variational, but it's gonna be variational here. Uh, uh, it's the evidence lower bound that if we're interested in this left-hand term here, uh, what's bounded from below by this term, which translates into this uh, cute little formula that we're going to uh, talk about over and over again, the expectation over the learner distribution uh, of trajectories of beta times the return minus this sort of regularization term of uh, KL divergence from, of the learner from some prior, uninformed prior. And so you can look at this and say, um, okay, sure, yeah, you can't optimize the left-hand side, so you optimize the right-hand side instead. Um, it's a cute computational trick. Um, maybe some, some call it a proxy, so the right-hand side is sort of a proxy for the left-hand side. Um, but is it really just a practical proxy for what you're really interested in? So as, as, as beta goes to infinity, um, and we sort of give more and more weight to this uh, value term here, the reward term here, uh, uh, as opposed to the regularizer, then this falls back into our just original uh, objective of maximizing reward. Um, but what about finite beta? Is that just a convenience or, or uh, something that's computationally easier? I'm gonna argue that, that no, we actually, sometimes want the objective itself to be a finite beta, not just an approximation, but sort of a form of bounded optimality. Sometimes we should, we need to admit that we just cannot be really optimal, but just in a bounded way. And I'm gonna argue that this is a good way to describe what bounded optimality means. Uh, so so um, um, just, just to, to give a taste of what, what I mean here, recall that we defined, uh, the, the, the return as the log probability ratio of the trajectories. This decomposes into rewards and this decomposes into log probability ratio of every step. Uh, so it's like deviation of, of a learning signal provided by a teacher from some prior. Now, um, think about what this means. It means that, so what it means for beta to be sort of uh, infinity it kind of means that uh, the teacher needs to be infinitely certain about what, what it's telling us, uh, which in practice is just not possible. If there's any sort of uncertainty about our learning signal, then um, we, we kind of want beta to be finite because this right-hand side is going to be finite. So we kind of want our left-hand side to be finite as well. Um, and let me give just some concrete uh, uh, examples. I don't know if we'll really have time to go over all four of these, 
Um, but we want better to be finite when we have epistemic uncertainty. So we're not sure about uh, the model or, 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 or our estimates of it. Uh, when we have communication constraints between different components of our controller, when we have representational constraints, uh, for example, when we are um, representing it with, with some function approximation, maybe a neural network, or maybe maybe some form of structure that we impose on the solution um, as an inductive bias. And finally, when we have adversarial optimization, so we actually have an adversary that is trying to optimize against us, and then we have a lot of uncertainty about what they're gonna do. They're gonna second guess us and we're gonna second guess them, and we have a lot of uncertainty. So um, this is sort of a, a summary of, of, of the introduction, and um, I'm now sort of gonna dive into some of the results that sort of justify what I'm claiming here. Uh, and so if, uh, if the math kind of caused you to zone out, this is a good time to uh, tune back in and to help you do that, here's, here's a dog with uh, Zoom fatigue. Um, I can assure that he's looking at you, uh, but just not at the camera. Um, so uh, let's let's start with with sort of uh, a result that um, um, is 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 from my my PhD advisor uh, and colleagues. Um, you, we can sort of view this this objective with a finite beta as a trade off between uh, um, value and information. Now this this scale term is not exactly information. You can measure it in bits, but it's it's more like uh, um, the extra information that the lear learner has with respect to prior. And so as we, as we uh, switch, as we uh, vary beta, uh, we can sort of play with that trade-off. So when beta is very low, we care much more about information. When it's very high, we care more about reward, about value. Uh, and then that's how we get this curve here, uh, which goes from, uh, less information invested in collecting value. So you get less value. Uh, and as beta increases, it's worth it to invest more information um, to get more value. Um, and there's actually an interesting thing happening here. You can see a, a knee in this, in this curve. Um, specifically, it was constructed to have this knee because it, uh, uh, the environment here has this long, narrow uh, corridor, or maybe uh, maybe it's a bridge. Um, and, and let's see what happens when we are at, in A, when we are uh, willing to invest a lot of information. So beta is very high, so we care much more about reward. We're willing to invest a lot of information or, or deviation from the prior, and that's what we do here. Uh, the prior is uniform, we deviate a lot to really uh, walk that narrow bridge to get to the goal, uh, in the shortest number of steps possible. That's the highest reward here. But as we decrease beta, uh, we, we start paying more attention to how much uh, information it costs us. Uh, and maybe we become more stochastic until eventually there's a phase transition and we actually prefer to go around. It's a longer path, but we're less, uh, but we need to focus less. We need to invest less in information to make sure we, we, we don't fall off the bridge. Um, and so this, there's this nice phase transition and it, it really manifests in this example where we, we walk through a minefield. And so if we think we know where the mines are, yeah, maybe we can invest a lot of information and walk through the minefield um, between the mines and maybe everything is gonna be fine. But maybe, maybe not. Maybe uh, we have some uncertainty about where the mines are. Maybe they shift a little bit. Um, and it's probably a bad idea to go through a minefield. Let me emphasize that. So, right. So that's a reason, right? We, because we have sort of this uncertainty that we can model with. Um, let's not commit too much to actions uh, because they may optimize for the for the wrong model. And so, so Roy, um, um, there, there's yeah. another question by Jonathan. Um, so he asks, so the idea is that the model in C is not a limited condition since, since it accounts for those special conditions discussed earlier, despite it having a lower expected value. Um, yeah, so you're gonna have a lower expected value, uh, but the objective is gonna be higher 
because you also need to trade it off with uh, with information or, or this KL term. All right? Does that, does that answer your question? I think I missed something, but um, but let me move on and, and maybe if there's a follow up question. Um, all right. So so uh, we're trying to do the same thing with learning. So. Uh, if you know the famous Q learning algorithm, this is sort of the term for the Bellman error there. And, and um, the way it works, it's sort of a temporal difference algorithm. So we take uh, the difference between the, uh, the value computed using the next step Q uh, and the value computed the current step Q, um, uh, for the current step Q, right? We maintain this Q function and this difference is as a temporal difference and that's a signal that, um, uh, um, with with taking one step, uh, we we learn something about the world that we want to incorporate into our Q function. And the thing we learn is you know, we get to see some reward, we get to see some transition of state, and then we sort of assume that then we're going to continue with the best action possible from the next state. But what happens when we don't really know this Q very well? then we sh should probably not optimize uh, too hard. Optimizing sort of pre pretends that we know more than we do. And so we can have a Bellman error for a temporal difference algorithm with bounded RL. And I, I won't go, th go through the entire math, but it goes something like this. And, and, um, and um, we can turn this into an algorithm kind of like Q learning. We can do soft Q learning. We can just update Q uh, with a mal free off policy estimator of, of, of this Bellman error. Um, same as Q-learning. And now we have this sort of operator here, the log expectation exponent operator, um, which is kind of like a soft maximum operator. So it's a soft version of the maximum operator of Q. Um, it's not soft max. Some people call it soft max, but soft max is actually a different thing. Um, but it does behave similarly in the sense that as beta goes to infinity, this operator uh, tends to the max. Uh, as beta goes to zero, it tends to the prior, the expected Q according to a prior uh, policy. And so a problem with the original Q learning is that it actually overestimates Q. There's a thing called the winner's curse kind of falls from uh, Janssen's inequality, if you know it, uh, which if there's any uncertainty about Q, you're taking max Q, max of your estimator, it's positively biased as an estimator of, of the maximum expected Q, the maximum uh, actual Q. And so uh, Q learning introduces bias through its updates. Um, but then if we, if we uh, took the other extreme of beta and we took just the expected with some prior of, of, of Q, it would underestimate the maximum because it's just a dumb prior. Uh, and so just by the intermediate value theorem, there has to be some beta in between, a finite beta for which this sort of soft maximum operator is an unbiased estimator um, of, our, of our Q or at least it does not introduce new bias in every update. And so if we just use this for value duration, not even learning, we can immediately see that uh, the max operator, so this is just the, the vanilla value duration algorithm, it sort of introduces a lot of bias early on and then it kind of struggles to, to uh, get rid of it. Um, it just updating the value from a prior. So, so trying to, to estimate how good is just a dumb prior policy. Um, initially, we, 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 uh, we get very close, but then it gets bad because the prior policy is just not a very good policy as an estimator for the, the optimum value. But if we sort of interpolate between them, we sort of schedule beta to be small initially because we have higher certainty and then increase it gradually. So we sort of interpolate from the prior to the max uh, gradually, this was probably not the best uh, interpolation, uh, but you can see the green curve here, which outperforms both. Um, and just just to give you a sense uh, how well this works for um, for learning, this is sort of kind of all results um, for the tabular case, and it outperforms 
many other algorithms. The, the point to take away from this here is that here we schedule beta linearly in the number of learning iterations we take. Um, and that was heuristic and we didn't really know what we were doing. It just worked well, uh, seemed, to, seemed to be the right thing to do. We know beta should go from zero to infinity. So this may be a good way to do it. Um, and then we had uh, uh, um, last year uh, a result that sort of justifies this, this heuristic, this intuition. Um, we can, we can uh, the algorithm is a little bit different. Uh, instead of having uh, this log um, um, exponent, uh, expectation exponent operator, we have exactly softmax operator, which is this one here, sort of weights um, Q by, uh, by its exponent. Um, and so uh, if, we, if that's the algorithm you use, and it, then you can actually find in closed form what beta here should be for this update to be unbiased. And it has this nice cute form if everything is distributed uh, Gaussian, which it, it approximately is in practice, um, then uh, the unbiased beta is two times the difference between uh, the best action and the next best action over the variance of that uh, difference. And that grows as uh, linearly as, as big O of uh, the number of times that you've seen the state. Now, this, this is a more nuanced analysis than before, because now we can have beta different for every state. Um, and not just average over the number of states. Of course, if we can actually maintain this, uh, either this counter of how many times we've seen a state or an estimator of how suboptimal um, the, the suboptimal action seems to be. And some notion of uncertainty, that's actually critical. Um, so just to give you some results, um, uh, to convince you that I'm um, that that this works, um, so this is like uh, the the uh, scheduling of beta that we use here in the blue curve, and uh, the estimation uh, of the value uh, is better than just vanilla Q learning, or if the schedule was two times as fast or two times as slow, and also the bias that we get is actually much better in our value estimation. Um, but the really interesting, the really promising um, use of this uh, goes much beyond that. And I'll just give you a, a preview of, of, of current work um, uh, performed by, uh, by Dei Hu. Um, we call it drill, discriminative reinforcement and mutation learning. And the idea is this, so ask yourself, what does soft Q learning do when uncertainty is high. Um, so um, it, it, it does not know a lot about what to do. Uh, it doesn't trust the Q, learn, the Q uh, value very much. Um, and so beta is very low. In a sense, it falls back onto the uninformed prior. Um, that's what all we have then, that's what we do. Well, what if we have uh, multiple supervisors? So. Um, it's a mixture of, of, of supervisors. Uh, they're not all equally good and they're not uh, equally good everywhere. So uh, in different states, there could be different supervisors who are, who are better or worse. And in particular, let's talk about reinforcement learning and imitation learning. What if we are doing imitation learning from an imperfect teacher? So in some states, the teacher just does not know what to do. Um, and maybe we want to fall back on reinforcement learning, on what we can learn on our own. So here's an example of that, um, the, the trap maze. So uh, uh, we want to uh, traverse the maze, a misstep drops you into the trap where you kind of need to go all the way to the door to try again. Um, the problem is that you have a teacher uh, who can really solve the maze, but knows nothing about the trap. Well maybe they haven't been there because they're so good at the mains. Um, and so uh, if, if, uh, if you're trying to learn from the teacher, but early on um, you, take, you take a misstep, you fall into the trap, now the teacher doesn't help you. Now you need to get out of the trap by yourself on your own. Um, 
And so if we do RL with this in this domain uh, without a teacher, it can take us a lot of time to learn the maze. Of course, when the maze is harder than what you see here. Uh, when we do mutation learning, we just cannot get out of track because um, we never get to see good demonstrations of that because the teacher doesn't know. But if we combine the two, so we learn from the teacher, except when we sort of know or identify that the teacher is fallible, then uh, we fall back to reinforcement learning and we can learn both. So that's a preview of uh, ongoing work. Some, uh, some cool initial results. Moving on, um, um, and in the interest of time, I want to say just very little about, um, um, actually, questions so far? Maybe uh, it's a good time. Mm. Yeah, Roy, I have a question. Yep. Um, so uh, thanks, it's a great talk so far. Um, so I'm convinced that uh, you know soft reinforcement learning helps uh, for epistemic uncertainty, but it seems like what we really want to be doing is estimating and quantifying that epistemic uncertainty. For example, for exploration, uh, maybe through uh, Bayesian reinforcement learning. Um, so, yep. what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, almost. At every turn in our research, what, what we find is that, oh, if only we had this explicit measure of uncertainty, uh, maybe through Bayesian um, um, deep learning, re deep reinforcement learning. Um, I, I, I think my, and I may, may not be up to date on that field, but my sense is that it's just uh, the um, methods are just not there yet in terms of being usable for this. So people have been trying to use it for, for this or similar things, but, but you really need um, um, calibrated um, measures of uncertainty uh, for this to work. It's not just a qualitative measure, you actually need to compute uh, a beta in the end. And, and the method is just not there yet, but, um, but we haven't tried the latest methods and that's actually um, a good thing to try. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right, so moving on, uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, just to give you a sense of what, uh, how uh, communication constraints can sort of give rise to this notion of, of bounded optimality. So, so consider this, this sort of setting where uh, we have the agent observing the world through some observations, through some sensor, uh, but then there's maybe a, a, a limited uh, 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 capacity channel between the sensor of, of the agent and its actuator, which then controls the environment. And maybe there's some memory involved as well. And so you can imagine the brain trying to convey to the leg what it should be doing and, and, and uh, the bandwidth there is kind of, kind of narrow. Um, um, definitely at the high rate that we maybe want to be running or something. Uh, and so transmitting um, something about the observation to the actuator to decide the action over this noisy channel or, 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 or limited channel um, may, may be hard. So uh, we can sort of measure how much, how many bits it takes to sort of encode this information. And that's again, the scale divergence term. Um, which, uh, which gives sort of maybe, maybe this is a good principle for, for how it came to be uh, rather than just a regularizer. Uh, and uh, if we ask what is um, the optimal pi zero, because if, if it's our leg, we can actually over evolutionary times optimize the leg. So we can actually um, agree on this prior with which we encode this information, um, but it cannot depend on the observation because the receiver, the decoder does not know what the observation was. So it's sort of like a prior here in the sense of not seeing the observation. And it turns out that the optimum is the margin of, of, of the distribution of, of the action. And so what we get is, is uh, exactly that this scale is equals the information between the observation and the action. So it's really uh, the, the, the number of bits of information between the observation and action that we pay when we transmit this information. When we have memory, we can actually 
also do this analysis. It's not perfect. Uh, um, the, all the nice separability theorems do not hold, but it's still a good approximation. We can treat the memory reader as just another sensor and the memory writer is just another actuator. And so um, in this cute little uh, double mass spring damper example, um, we, we, we get these curves. So as a function of, of beta on the left, log beta, and or as a function of the bits of information on the right, we get to see the cost uh, on the y-axis. Um, so generally it goes down as, as, as we uh, care more about the reward or as we are willing to invest more information. These are the same uh, results just shown on different planes. Uh, and you can see uh, phase transitions, which is it's really exciting to me. Uh, for example, between these two red dots, uh, these are actually two solutions. These are um, discontinuous phase transitions, uh, two solutions coexisting with the same, um, 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 uh, not the same cost, but the same uh, trade-off between cost and information. Um, at the same time, and um, and and you sort of switch between one and the other, non-smoothly, which is kind of tricky and, and exciting. Uh, and and this is really just uh, dimensionality reduction in this controller. So we sort of can get controllers of lower uh, lower dimension in a principled way. Um, that was that was just a quick overview uh, of some more work, just to give you a sense of what that means here. Um, I do want to spend a bit more time about talking about representational constraints. So um, imagine that we have um, parametric representations of, of the agent, so pi theta with some parameter vector uh, theta. That's good. We want that because that allows generalization. If we have a large state space, maybe we can generalize to states that we have not seen before, um, and that's important. But optimizing over parameter space is often very hard, as you all know. Um, and, the, and the outcome is often suboptimal. We don't really imagine that we can get optimal um, um, parameters for our deep networks, just something that works pretty well, um, but not optimal. Um, and the, the cool thing here is that beta actually controls the same beta that we had before, um, controls how fast our sort of optimization lens, landscape, uh, this log probability of, of success falls with suboptimal behavior. Um, so if beta is high, it falls off very, very fast. And that could be hard to optimize. It's like a password game. If you get it even slightly wrong, everything is wrong, everything is bad. What have you learned? Uh, and so um, that's that's a, a practical reason for beta to be finite, so that the optimization landscape is not so rough. Um, but uh, and so if, if beta is finite, uh, then then this sort of um, the value that we'll be getting, this log probability of success, is best approximated by this term that we've seen all along. And you may think, okay, well, you're just talking about regularization. You're taking your objective and just regularizing it with, um, with just uh, maximum re uh, relative entropy in this case. And, and yes, yeah, that's true. But, but also there's something a bit more here, maybe solve. It's like taking regularization, uh, putting it on its head. It's like a reverse argument. It's, I'm, not, I'm not just saying that um, uh, we, optimization is hard, let's regularize, now it's easier. That's true too, but I'm also saying regularization is hard. Uh, sorry, optimization is hard. We're not going to get it perfectly. Uh, conditioned on that, what we get in effect is something like this regularization. So it's 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 more of a result than than a premise. Um, taking a very concrete example uh, uh, of this sort of variational imitation learning. Uh, going back to, to what we discussed before. So, uh, so far we had this uh, KL divergence between the learner and the teacher, which gave us dense rewards, but learner exploration. Let's talk again about the other KL term. 
where we do get teacher demonstrations. Uh, but let's add back those memory states. So not just um, uh, um, an agent that, in, that reactively uh, sees states or observations and just reacts, but has actually some memory. Um, and maybe that memory we don't get to see in demonstrations. So maybe the teacher shows us the correct actions to take uh, in the environment, but we don't get to see the internal state of the, of the teacher. That's the case with, with humans. Um, um, and so we need to sort of infer that, right? You need to so somehow um, learn with these latent variables, the, the memory states. And so we can again use the elbow and, uh, and this objective that we're interested in, the maximum likelihood that the learner would generate the teacher demonstration, we bounce from below by this elbow here, which includes also the latent memory states. And um, there's two cool parts, uh, that, things that we get from doing this. One is that uh, this sort of auxiliary distribution that we have uh, in variational inference, this uh, uh, inference model or distribution or proposal distribution that proposes memory states given the demonstration, that can actually depend on the entire demonstration, past and future, not just the past. So it's sort of a causal in a sense, uh, usually optimizing uh, in optimization in, in control learning is, is causal. We have a, a, an agent that needs to behave in a sequential way. But here we can do some sort of a causal optimization because we have this a training time, this uh, inference policy that can glimpse the future of demonstrations. The other thing is that we can actually include a lot of inductive bias in our models uh, in the form of, of structure of that memory. And so um, we're almost out of time. Um, uh, let me just very quickly say what I mean by this a causal uh, thing and, and how it's useful. So um, just a simple example where um, we observe this uh, blurry object and we need to decide uh, how do we pick it up? Do we pick it up with our pinch gripper or with a suck gripper? Uh, and then the robot moves closer uh, to pick the object up. Now the robot can get a clearer picture of the object. Does, does the picking up with whatever arm reached and that's the end. Uh, now, the thing is that uh, there's a lot of information in this second observation about what we should have done. But that, inf that information is not causal. There's no causal link uh, between this action and this observation. We would see the same observation regardless of what we choose to do. Um, a concrete example, uh, we used MNIST for, for, for this to, to sort of show this. So MNIST for this blurry, uh, image of, of a digit, then we see the actual digit, and we need to guess if the digit is odd or even. And in demonstrations, we, we get to see a noisy version of that. And so if we try to use an RNN for this, there would actually be no signal from this second step to the first step, no signal whatsoever, zero uh, grading, because uh, this action here is constant. There's absolutely no grading coming back, so we never use this second observation for this learning, which is a shame because it really helps uh, to know what the correct answer is. And so, of course, that's what we've seen in, um, in experiments, uh, but in the interest of time, let me skip it. Now, one problem with uh, not being able to show you the dynamic slides is that this slide is a mess, uh, but uh, in the end, this is about um, a hierarchical structure over the agent's memory, um, which you could see nicely if I could play it. But in the end, it's like, imagine like uh, procedures, uh, procedure to play tennis that can call a sub procedure to do a forehand or another to do a backhand and the procedure, a sub procedure is executed until it terminates and then you can call another one. And you have the whole hierarchy of these. Uh, can you learn this? So each, each uh, procedure is actually represented by a neural network and can you learn that, or by a learnable model, and can you actually learn it from data? And so uh, this is this work where we actually did this with 
the same variational inference method that I mentioned before, we need to say how to represent the inference model, this Q, right, that infers latent memory states from demonstrations. So we did that with a bidirectional RNN. That's actually some uh, nice prior work uh, from uh, stochastic RNNs. Um, and and um, and there's another trick here that we need with masking, but uh, but the details are are not as important. Um, just just the the principle is that we need to mask for consistent memory states. Otherwise, we get um, to generate memory states that are impossible, and of course that doesn't work for uh, imitation learning for uh, for uh, version learning. Um, I know that this is far some details of how we did this. Uh, you can check out the paper, but uh, in practice, it works nicely for learning uh, some some uh, some programs. So we see traces of the programs, uh, of course, without the internal state of the program, just sort of the action that it took. This is from the Carol um, programming language where it sort of controls a robot. So we get to see what the robot does, but not why, so to speak. Uh, and you can you can infer that from less data uh, in these experiments and generalize to longer uh, executions of the same program. So Roy, there are um, five yep. minutes left. I know. Yeah, we're we're nearly done. I just want to very quickly uh, talk about uh, the serial optimization. This is ongoing work um, with uh, uh, Stephen McLear and um, and JB Lanier. Um, but uh, but but uh, just just very quickly uh, in the presence of, of an adversary. Um, so if we if we uh, sort, of, sort of bounded optimization is sort of built into game theory uh, already there. Because if you imagine playing rock paper scissors, let's say uh, the other player is is always playing rock. Um, you can't just uh, you can't just exploit it by always playing paper. Because then you're exploiting it, right? So you need you need some sort of modesty in your attempt to uh, to optimize um, and reach this sort of Nash equilibrium when neither of you is is better off deviating. Um, um, I probably don't have time actually to go over this new work that we did. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to this awesome work and um, and mention that in the adversarial context. Uh, banded optimization is also important. So um, just, just a, a sense of, of, of a few future directions. This is really just about trust. In the end, that's, that's what, it, what it is. It's about how much do I trust my learning signal and um, can I estimate how much I trust it and use it to exactly the right amount that I trust it. Um, when I have multiple supervisors, how much do I trust each of them and how do I combine that and when I have sort of this changing optimization landscape uh, because of an adversary or, or in other situations, can I sort of anticipate how it's going to change and not try to optimize too hard uh, in those cases where it's just going to change and I, I have uncertainty about the future of that process. So um, thank you. These are my awesome collaborators. And um, maybe there's time for a few questions. All right, thank you, Roy. This was a really fascinating talk. Um, and I have a lot of questions uh, that I'd love to follow up with you, uh, but I also want to kind of uh, let the audience speak, but maybe to kind of just get started. Um, so um, about your prior, right? Uh, you know, you gave one example where the prior was relatively simple, and I think it kind of was just like moving into a random direction. Um, could you imagine of priors where you, that are being learned also? Or that are sort of only conditioning on on a subset of observations. Uh, you know, can you comment on that? Or is there some line of research? Absolutely, yes. So, so first of all, a prior is a great way to incorporate any prior knowledge that you have. Uh, like, if you know that robots should not go into walls, you can bake that into your your prior. Maybe you don't know much else, but at least that you can bake into it. Uh, and yes, you can absolutely learn it, and that that is actually a very promising approach because that can also transfer, right? Maybe you can learn things in sort of a meta learning um, approach where uh, you, you can learn the things that do transfer well between different tasks. 
and, and use them as priors for the routing task. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I mean, anybody else, please feel free to either just directly speak up or post your questions into the chat. Um, maybe one other question quickly uh, on your phase diagram that you showed. Can you explain that again? The, the one with beta and this phase transition that you observed? This one? Um, yes. Can you explain this? Sure. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, well, in blue, you get to see the uh, uh, controller without memory. And in green, it's a controller with memory. So it's, so it's better, the, the costs are generally lower. Um, and the shade tells you the dimensionality of the control. So uh, the darker gets, uh, use more dimensions for your controller, right? Um, so when, when, uh, you, uh, when beta is low, you, you value your, your uh, reward less, uh, or you're just constrained for information, um, then, uh, then you go left in, in these curves, the cost gets higher, but also the dimensionality undergoes phase transitions and, and is reduced uh, in a discrete way, right? So there's like a, um, a, a threshold, um, um, a critical point, um, critical beta where under, under it, uh, um, you sort of start controlling at the lower dimension because some extra dimensions are just not worth it. Right, and you see, All and right. you see that happening actually um, in the in the um, controller with memory. You see that happening four times. Two times are sort of smooth transitions here between zero and one, and two and three, and two times it's uh, it's discontinuous phase transitions where you switch from one solution to another without going gradually between them. Here and here. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any other questions? If that's not the case, then um, thank you very much, Roy, again. And I look forward to following up with you. And thanks, everyone else. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.